you. So start off by telling me about yourself. Are you born and raised Saudi Daisy, or did you just end up here after the war, I think I read, or? I was, I was born right up here in Daisy, it was Daisy then, you know. Daisy, yeah. And right up here on what's called Church Street now, it was called Red Row then, because my father was a kill foreman for the Hurdy Brick and Tile Company. And I was born there, of course, in 1925, and 25. the top market fell in 29. And we moved down as far as Falling Water, so there's basically where I was raised around Falling Water. And uh, except for my being gone off to the service, I don't, there's not been not been many years at all past that I didn't live here. So da so born born and raised kind of Daisy, but then you moved to Falling Water, went off to the service, ended up and back in Saudi Daisy when you came yes, back. Yes, gotcha. with the, uh -huh. And now how many kids did you your parents have or brothers and sisters did you have? Well, my father had uh, three sons and then three daughters before he died. He died in 1936. Really? I was 11 years old. Was it an accident at work or? No, it was, uh, I don't know. I, I, from the symptoms he had, I would say it was either lung cancer or black lung, one or the other. Back then we didn't know anything about cancer, you know, so. Yeah, the medical technologies. But uh, he yeah. was down and out. He took his bed in February and died in April, so. He was a very strong man prior to that. So. Now, your two brothers, were you the only one who uh, was in the service? No, my oldest brother went in the first draft, and but he served in the South Pacific. In the Marines? And uh, my other brother was crippled. He had a crippled leg, and they wouldn't take him in. So, uh, was your oldest brother in the Marines or the Navy? He was in the Army. Army, yeah. Army. And uh, we kind of left. He, he hadn't been in about two weeks when he was a corporal. <laughs> so he moved up they, quick. They, they moved him up to help reopen Count Pickett, and I guess the name had some effect about him. So they, they reopened the Count Pickett, Virginia, and then, they, then he went and went into the, uh, another well, it was actually an infantry out, 77th Infantry Division. So him getting drafted first, probably 42, was it? Right at the beginning there? No, uh, yeah, it was, I believe it was 42, 42, I'm not sure. So your family was impacted pretty early from U.S. involvement. Oh, yes. In the war, and you guys were probably, you know, it'd be hard not to be nervous, I think, yeah. In those yeah. circumstances. Oh, yeah. What year, or what kind of was, do you remember the feeling among your family and the community at the time about the, you know, first the uprising in Europe and then Pearl Harbor? What was kind of the, do you remember your feeling at the time before you were in the service? Well, yes, of course, when he went in, I, uh, I kind of idolized him since he was the oldest brother, you know, the father gone. So my, my big desire was to get on in, see. And of course my brother and my other brother couldn't go and, and mom wouldn't sign for me to get in at 17, see. So, when, so I, I, and of course we was all just upset like it when Pearl Harbor and things like that happened, you see. Really, I, I didn't know a whole lot about uh, Germany or anything like that, you know. We were raised back out here in the sticks, you know. And now, Pearl Harbor, you know, a lot of people, you know, I, of course, know where I was during 9-11. Uh, do you remember where you were here in the news about Pearl Harbor? Well, yeah, I knew, know where I lived. I had we had moved up into the Saudi section for two or three years, and that's where I lived. And, and then when my brother went in, well, we we left that place and went back to the old home place in Falling Water. 
So you don't remember maybe uh, specifically where you were, like hearing it on the radio, or I think it was on a Sunday, so maybe some folks were at church, and um, you know, it was a long time ago. So, yeah, yeah. it's a long time to, to remember exactly where I was, because you know, uh, radios and televis televisions, or televisions especially. <laughs> Brand new. So, I, I don't, and really I didn't fully understand, you know, because... You would have been, let's see, 20, you would have been only 16, so it's yeah. hard to understand geopolitical, wartime yeah. politics, you yeah. know, when you're only 16. Yeah, it, but uh, I did, I did realize that it was bad, you know, but that's about it as far as you say I could go with it. Now, do you remember, well, obviously you would remember this, uh, you, you were drafted or did you enlist or? Well, as I say, mom wouldn't let me enlist, so I, I had found, uh, I took a job in downtown in some sheet metal work. At Chad, and, downtown Chattanooga? Yeah, yeah, and I, I had been living down there, and so when my draft notice came, I put on it, I was unemployed, so I knew they'd take me right away, so. I, you would have turned 18 by then, obviously. Well, when I turned 18 in, uh, uh, in April of uh, 43, well then I was sworn in in June. So you were drafted pretty quick after you Thanks. turned well, I 18. Well, I unemployed so they would have drafted me quick. Oh, so, okay, so you're filling out probably your draft oh, form yes. before you were drafted. You said unemployed, so hoping that they would draft you yeah, in, yeah. next thing you know. Yeah, but, they sent out the questionnaires, you know, and that's what I put on the questionnaire. Unemployed. On purpose. I, I knew in reason they would do it, or I felt like they would do it, so they took me right on in. I'll be gone. Yeah. Now, okay, so officially in the Army, June 43, uh, where did you go from Chattanooga? Where was your basic? Well, of course, I went in at Fort Oglethorpe, where I was sworn in, and then I went to Fort McClellan, Alabama. For your basic? Yeah. See, I, I, I didn't have full education, and I didn't get into high school even because of dad's death and that eating was necessary then, and it was hard to do. So you went, instead of high school, you were working. Yeah. Before the sheet metal, what was it? Do you remember? Well, it wasn't anything but just more or less uh, pick up jobs until the war started, you know. So I just handy work around town? Around uh, farms or coal mines or any place like that that I could get a few hours cut timbers for coal mines there at Saudi and while a boy. And so just stuff like that, it was not a regular job. And you were providing for a big family because like you said, your brother was unfortunately and had to deal with his condition and then you're, you you had three sisters and a mom and yeah, so, so you were you were kind of man of the household, uh, yeah, well, you and your older brother maybe, yeah, oldest well, brother for... Older brother was out of the way and gone, so that was, well, that's just what I chose to do, you know, and... So, end up in Alabama for BASIC, and from my understanding is that BASIC at that time was very expedited. You weren't in BASIC for... Very uh, long. I, I think it was about 13 weeks at basic. And, 13, okay. And that was, of course, the, uh, let's see, if, how they enlisted. And anyway, it was in, uh, training for infantry training. And that's what they... Do you mind, because your glasses, do you mind if I shut these? Because the, light, the light's reflecting off your glasses. Okay. Do you mind if I just maybe this first, yeah, this yeah, first one? Fix it. Oh, yes. Yeah, that'll do. That's perfect. So you go to Alabama for basic, and it's 13 weeks. Does that include your MOS training, your specific job training, or that 13 weeks, or was that after basic? Well, all, all it was was the uh, 
information, well, it's infantry training center, so that was basically all they gave us was just infantry training. First steps in infantry training, you see. And So you knew from the get-go that you were going to go infantry as your job? Well, of course, I didn't even think anything about it. I was just in the Army, and wherever they sent me, I'd go. And as far as having a preference, I, I did at one time try to get into the paratroopers, but at that time they had a weight limit and I, I thought it wasn't heavy. <laughs> was it, uh, it was 50 more a paycheck, wasn't it? Uh, it was about 50 more a paycheck, I think, if yeah. you were a para paratrooper? Yeah. Um, but, so you were infantry, that's what you trained, um, and it sounds like probably working timber, uh, working sheet metal, Army infantry boot camp was probably not too grueling compared to the work you were already used to. No, uh, actually they tried their best to get me to go into the Navy because of that little bit of sheet metal work that I had done, see, but uh, I refused. I said, well, follow my brother, see, I won't do in the Army. And yeah, because I know in the Navy they, they had a, uh, on each crew had a kind of a workshop where there was metal workers, yeah. you know, to work on the ships yeah. and stuff. But, uh, so you were pretty skilled in some things. Now, uh, do you remember any kind of tough challenges when you were in boot camp? Uh, climbing under barbed wire while there's live oh, rounds yeah. or reciting the creed while there's gas going all, on? Or? All of it. I was put through all of that. To be um, now, um, so, did you know when you were drafted and you're going through infantry boot camp and so on, did you know that this was for, did you know you would be heading towards Europe or were you, didn't know if you would go Pacific, uh, East know. Asia, Europe, didn't know where you would go? We had no choices, I just, wherever they took us, that's where we went. Yeah. So, still 43 when you were in Alabama training, do you remember when and where you went after Alabama? Well, I come by home for seven seven days, and, and we met back in Fort Meade, Maryland, and we stayed there. It was just uh, might, might as well say a week or two, and then sent on down to POE and said, "Oh, I went. I, re, I arrived with my outfit, 29th Division, 29th Infantry Division." Somewhere about the first of January, forty-four. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it, it, I tried to always believe that it was between Christmas and January, but I'm not positive it could have been somewhere there. around the turn of the year. Right, right at the first of January. I'm sure it was right at the first of January. January anyway. Okay. Um, so you're kind of moving around East Coast. When did you find out, and obviously if you're on the East Coast, you know you're going to Europe, probably by that yeah, point. Yeah. Were you doing training drills up along the East Coast, doing amphibious landings maybe, or? No, nothing like that. All we done was just more or less exercise. And Sorry about that. These telemarketing calls are just <laughs> good at still recording. Okay. Just it was just more or less exercise to staying in condition. Though now at the end of that thirteen weeks, we were in pretty good condition. I was pretty strong. And uh, matter of fact, they had a sergeant up there in Fort Meade that tried to run us boys to death. Done it on purpose, of course. And he said he could run all day. It was about three or four of us said, "Well, we go away here." You, you we, met his challenge. We stayed right with him. All day. He finally just sat down and said, well, it's foolish, we'd kill her. <laughs> Were you getting promoted at this time, too? Probably not as quickly as your brother, but... Uh... No, no, no. No such thing as a promotion for me at my education, the places I was going to. And, of course, that wasn't a thing but a place to prepare us and get us equipped and, and all of this stuff to go overseas. And then, when we went from there to Port of Embarkation, see, just a few weeks. And Being on the East Coast, were you ever scared of, or maybe even aware of, the possible German 
uh, submarine attacks and uh, maybe plane or even land invasions. There was probably at least a little talk of that, right? They talked about it all the time and trying to what to do if this this and that comes out when we're at the hell is ready. So they kept that just going to midtime all the time, you see, un until we got aboard ship. When we got aboard ship, uh, traveling out, uh, they said about almost a third of the time we was headed back toward the United States, dodging the U-boats that was in, in the Atlantic. You're talking about when you were moving over toward when Europe? Was, when I was going overseas, yeah. It took what? six days to get over there from New York. Probably would have been what March, April, May, forty-four, somewhere in there. Uh, Maybe even well, it, May. I don't know. It was it was a right close Christmas time. You see that we went over. Oh, there. so forty-three. Yeah. Forty-three. You got over to Europe, and yeah. were there for a while. Well, six okay. months. Well, well, for the rest of the war, but before the D-Day invasion, about. Well, I was, I was in. I joined the 29th Division, which was in practice then for the invasion, you see. And in the States or in Europe? In, in England. In yeah. Europe. And well, we landed in uh, Scotland, rode a train all the way down to, uh, to the well the lower end. Uh, uh, names excuse, escape me, so. Of the towns there. Uh, yeah, but we went all the way down there to where they headquarters of the division was, you know. 29th. Yeah, and uh, they just run us through and put so many in one place, throw me in another place and all this kind of stuff. Because it was a National Guard outfit, ours was, out of Virginia. Well, it actually was National Guard of Washington, really. The State. The 175th Infantry uh, Regiment was uh, right in Washington and then the other two was out down in Virginia ways so yeah, so <clears throat> so you were kind of getting re you were probably in something stateside but you were getting reassigned once you arrived over into England well we into the, we trained in, was in a, our, our regiment was stationed just outside of the uh, Oh, that airport down right at the bottom of England. I know the name of it was good mine. Heathrow or Gatwick? Huh? Heathrow? No. Gatwick? Those are the only two no. I don't know. I don't Plymouth. Know. Oh, Plymouth, okay. <laughs> okay. Plymouth. So it was Plymouth, England. We was out of Plymouth in a small village place type right, called uh, Ivy Bridge. And that's the where our basis was, of course, we was out on maneuvers all up in the manoeuvres for a week or two at a time, and then on out to sea and come back on landings and stuff like that, practicing on amphibious training. So this is when you're really getting ready, when you're in those six months in England, you're doing amphibious landings. Uh, now, I know there was some kind of last-ditch effort by the German Air Force to do some bombings in this period. Do you remember any? Oh, sure. They bombed us all the time. They're in Plymouth and we're just out. We were just far enough out that we didn't get a whole lot of it on our account. But now and then one, one of the bombs would hang and we'd get it out there. So we had our, our bomb trenches and everything to get in. When they... Did you ever have any close calls that you remember? Well, they only, they only hit real close to us about one time, but they were doing an awful lot of bombing, and, and from where we was, if we <clears throat> we could stay out and watch the lights that they shined on the planes as they went by with the art, I mean, the anti-aircraft were firing at them and all that kind of stuff. So we was we was pretty well under far enough to, enough to be acquainted with what was going on. Would you just, uh, whatever you're doing, drop everything, run and jump in the, if, was it a slit trench they called it? If it gets so close, you know, well, you move that. So you could see the German fighters and bombers at some points yeah, flying over Yeah, because they had huge lights that they trained on them, you see, and followed the airplane around, and, there, and then you could see that. It was all nighttime bombing. See the flak of, uh, around there when the shells bursted around them and all that kind of stuff, so it was... Boy, what a sight that must have been to see. 
Did you ever get see one get shot down or hit by the flak? Oh yeah, yeah. They, every once in a while they'd tire one out, of course. <laughs> and uh, sometimes they see another small planes up after them too. You see. Mm -hmm. And. Did you ever see a German uh, maybe parachute out and be taken prisoner or? Well, no, not particularly that I would remember. I never seen one of them parachute out. But, uh, and, but, uh, Did you ever parachute out? I know you said you weren't a uh, paratrooper, but. Uh, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't take me in because it was too light, so I had to stay with what I was training to do. See, that we, we did take. Uh, Infantry replacement training, and then we took uh, we took some ranger training, commando training, and jujitsu and stuff like this. We was we was busy, 24 hours a day. If they took an ocean, take us on 20 mile run at two o'clock in the morning, all we could do is go. The right. kind of training. This sounds rougher than boot all, camp. <laughs> it's almost unreal to. To believe it, unless you're there now. I guess the worst thing that they done to us that I feel was overdone. We put on full field equipment. Now you know what that is about 70, 60, 70 pounds, and do a 20 mile forced march, no brakes, continue to walk it. They would come along and hand us a sandwich out at dinner time, smoke and eat and drinks. Do the 20 miles before we stopped. Now, I thought that was kind of punishment. Of course, your feet might get to hurt, you might get a skint place inside your shoes or anything. You see, there's no stopping, you kept going. You didn't have the opportunity to fall out of line. <laughs> So that sounds worse than boot camp. Well, it, it's forced. You see, that was that was making us trained for what we was going to reach in combat. If infantry didn't have any breaks at all in combat. You know, we just we just there to live or die. And so that I feel was what they was doing was forcing us to stand. Stuff that really was too, actually too hard to stand. I bet you were in the best shape of your life, though. Oh from yeah, all that. I was. I, I could. I could do my part. You believe me? Uh, and uh, so uh, you're you're training. You're training. Obviously, you know the purpose is for the mainland uh, invasion of Europe. When did you know, kind of? Okay, D Day's imminent. You know, I, I know they kept it under wraps, but when did you kind of feel that, okay, they're positioning us, moving us, getting us ready for we're about to hit? Every time we went out and come back in, we call them problems now when we, when we run a, a two-week amphibious run. Every time we went out, they told us then that was it. It was going to come back. So they would do kind of these test runs, keep you on your oh, feet? Oh, yeah, make us... Make us try to believe it, you know. Of course, we finally picked up on it for, because of the equipment we had and all the difference in equipment. Not not armed, you see. I mean, we had the rifles and things with no ammunition. So we knew that we went. When they gave the ammo. Out. So then even so, well, the last problem, call it a problem, that we were on, uh, they, we did it with live ammunition. And that was uh, for D-Day? Uh, that was for D-Day? Yeah, before, the last, last one we run before we oh. went. So one last practice run with, within D-Day? With, with live ammunition, so Eisenhower and Montgomery and all of them was, uh, was a speech or anything, he's usually just passing around through us there. But did you we, shake his hand? We was aboard ship on the way to France when he done that great talking to make to us. Was it over radio or? Over the, over the speakers, yeah. And, uh, so um, you know, okay, so you knew D-Day's coming because last trial, live ammo, one more time, live ammo, that's the one. Yeah. Uh, tell me about that. Uh, maybe writing a letter to your, or uh, I know that, it, and especially for the company you were in, they were expecting very high 
casualty numbers. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hell, it was. But we, we didn't consider that, and anything we wrote home was, was also processed. They wouldn't they, they'd take out any part that you mentioned, anything that shouldn't be. Don't you write a letter just in case you don't make it out to your parents, or...? I didn't want to worry my mother or anything like that, you see. Just, I just always let her know I'm doing okay. Um, Do you remember your meal? I think they fed you pretty hearty that uh, right before. Board ship, yeah. That night. Yeah, a matter of fact, they, they give us one and then we pulled out of ways and had to stop. <laughs> we had the second one. See, see, they were supposed to land on the fifth. Too. Bad weather. And, uh, so we was ready to go. Now, what they did after we'd done all this training, some of us got hurt. So uh, I got hurt on training because I was carrying a flamethrower, see. And I was actually a, a smaller guy, but I had the biggest load. <laughs> yeah, those okay. big tanks. Let me just drop a point into you. You might be asked, yeah. National Guard outfit comes in, regular army is replaced in the National Guard outfit. If there's any upgrading, it goes to these, not to these, okay? So we had no chance at all of any kind of rank or anything like that. We were just a fill-in, in other words. So I was carrying a flamethrower and, and uh, I got knocked unconscious. And, uh, and when I come back to pretty quickly, the training, Bangalore torpedoes, you have any idea what they are? Pipes, the five foot long, packs of TNT, okay. Scope them together and make as many of them as you want to. The guys that was in that portion of our boat section, you had three three guys in the portion there and two guys on the flamethrower, a certain amount of all the stuff. So in the duck boats, right? He was supposed to blow five sections of Bangalore torpedo under the water, which would make a little ditch and throw the water back. Okay. I'm supposed to be the second one in there, into the end of that ditch. And when he blew that, instead of blowing his five, he blew ten. I'm in 40 yards of that, and when that explosion went off, I'm, I'm laying down looking out from under my helmet like I was supposed to. Seemed like a little ripple from on the ground hit me under the chin. And I was, was it rock? Some so, kind of shrapnel? Yeah. Well, no, it wasn't just, just concussions, what it was. But, uh, so when I come to the fly, the lieutenant was hollering, where's my flamethrower? So I managed to get into the end of the ditch and over to the other end of it, I couldn't get out. I, I, my strength was gone for some reason, so they, they seen I was hurt and I stopped. So you were still trying to push on even yeah, after well, taking that well, blast. You automatically done what you trained for, especially at that age, you know. You don't even kind of consider breaking an order. You just done it, no matter who said it. And of course, when I got out, I was uh, I got awake enough to do anything. I'm my nose bleeding, what have you. And so they. They still told me there when we was talking, said, this is awfully important, we can take you out and send you back. So I said, well, I think I can make the rest of it. So I wanted the training, see, on the first I'd been under in, in live fire. So you weren't put out at all? No, I went on with them anyway. And so I made it well right as far as that part is concerned, but that's just my first problem in, the, in that. And so uh, you loaded up June 5, ready for D-Day, started bad weather, we loaded, came back. We loaded up on the 4th to land on the 5th and in the port. Now they took us, when they had everything settled, they took us, put us in a staging area, they called it. And we stayed a, a, a little bit over two weeks studying the beaches over there and sand tables and all of this kind of stuff so we would know what we was going to look at when we got there. So we was well trained and well ready to go. And so our captain about two days before our company commander captain, 
he he stopped, set us down to give us a talk, and he said he got in the front talking to us, give us a little speech, and then he said, "Now, now we're on our way." This on the fourth. Yeah, and he said, uh, "Of course, we was under guard because nobody could talk to us at all except we could talk among each other," and. He said, some of you are going to come back without legs, some without arms, some without eyesight. He said, and a lot of you is not going to come back. Then he walked back and forth a few times and let, us, let that all soak in, I reckon. And he said, turned around and said, if there's any man in this company that don't want to go, Get up out of you. See, we're sitting on the bank on the ground. He said, get up and come down here. There'll never be nothing said to you. There'll be no, nothing rude said to you. You just won't go from here. And that'll be all there is to it. So it won't be a thing. This was Company A? Didn't have them on go up. None of us went. Because we was all enthused, excited, and I don't know how to tell you what we felt like. We were wanting to get going. What's the company commander's name? Huh? Do you remember the company commander's name? Oh, yeah, Captain Fellers. Fellers. Yeah. He didn't get out of water on the day they got him. Uh, now, uh, company, refresh my memory. How many men strong was Company A? A TO for a amphibious company was about 85 men plus your officers, see. Now, they informed us that, that we would be a, a little over 200 because they was taking others along knowing that's going to have casualties. They knew that you were going to be the first to yeah. hit Omaha Beach. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah, we knew, we knew where we stood on that because we practiced that in training, see. So you see. knew you were the very first wave to, to oh, hit? Yeah, yeah, we knew it was going well. well there were supposed to be some engineers ahead of us. This this in our training down in that camp. The engineers supposed to get in there and knock out some pathways like but through the defenses to where we wouldn't have to be running over mines, have certain ways, certain ways to go, you know. As they went in and done this, they would hang a little, supposed to hang a little flag. If we seen a little flag, we knew to go that way. And all this kind of stuff was set up was the perfect way of doing it, you know. And but it didn't turn out that way. Well, no, we, passed, we passed them on the way in because the water was too rough. See, we went in in the, in the center of a storm. There was, there was place where it gets better in the middle of the storm. So that was, was the condition. And the water was bad, terribly bad, uh, 8 to 12 feet right. Do you remember your troop transport boat name? I know they just probably had numbers, maybe. Do you mean the, the small landing craft? Well, uh, first the one that took you across the channel. Yeah, it was uh, HMS Imperial Javelin. Imperial Javelin, okay. Yeah, okay. Now, that was a British ship. British crew running it. British landed Company A. We landed Company A, and the little boats that went in was LCAs, which was the French, or the English equivalent of the LCVP. Interesting. So it wasn't exactly how you had maybe trained for. There was little yeah, well, differences. There. That's the first time we'd seen an LCA when we landed. All our training had been an LCVP. Now you don't know the difference of it. The LCVP, the whole front dropped out. Mm -hmm. Okay. LCA had a little bar frame going around here and a place about that wide dropped out. Hmm. And we was equipped to drive on both sides of it just about. So that was the difference in the boats, and that's the first trip we had made in those. So you can imagine there was a boo-boo to begin with. Now, I, you know, it's, it's probably tough to recall, but do you remember just leading up to the invasion, you know, your company commander's speech, traveling on the British ship? Do you remember what was kind of going through your mind or maybe uh, 
what you were uh, kind of emotions or mentally thinking and well when we pulled out and stopped and had to sit there overnight to make the trip well, all commenced to cutting up. Yeah, he said, dry another dry run, another dry run, and all this kind of stuff. So we debated that to, on, on up. And even after we started, it was halfway over there. When Eisenhower made his speech, when he did that, we knew where we were going from there. And no, no questions about it. No turning back. Once no. the Eisenhower speech was the final giveaway that this is the. Yeah. And then kind of the. The joking about this being a dry run kind of stops, and that's when it quit quieting down. Believe me, it quieting down. Because if you look at the Hollywood recreation, Saving Private Ryan included, people are pretty stone faced now, at that point. That outfit, the first twenty minutes, of it, it's not exactly right. There's just things in it, but he did get across the point of what it was being like. See. So I think, the, oh, what was his name that done Spielberg. it? Spielberg. Yeah. I think he got the point across that he see because of the rough water. Matter of fact, I didn't see but two of them that ever got in. One of them opened one shot and they knocked him out and another that ever far to leave to the second one. You saw these tanks that were there? Yeah, yeah, they, yeah they, when they tried to get out. But, because uh, they wasn't too far behind us because our captain was a hard at some of them back and forth, and, and you know, they got going close to them going by, and uh, they was uh, trying to get him to hold up till they could get on in, what fuel was still floating. But he, uh, I remember he hollered, come on in. And so we just went on through, and then, then you're, uh, they had a, Ships back there with a uh, <laughs> shot over our head. You know what I'm talking about. I know what we're supposed to say, but that loses it. Uh, in other words, all the all that they shot over our heads just rained down in there. But it so rained. you're seeing little shells go over your head. Well, yeah, actually, it's uh, if I can think of the name, it's simple, but. Anyway, they, they fought over our heads to land on the beach to uh, kind of hold back the defense, you see, and give us places and things. But uh, they dropped in the water right in front of us. We, uh, they just barely missed us. So they didn't get on the beach at all. Our and you're did. seeing this splash, probably, and you're probably getting yeah, hit with the mist. They were popping. They were rockets, is what I was trying to say. Rockets, they rockets, rockets over our head. So they dropped a lot of them right in front of us, and uh, but there was nothing else in front of us then. You see, we was very first in Omaha Beach. And uh, so. Uh, um, were people maybe up chucking over the side or into the... Uh, Waiting in it in the boat. Some of them had their helmet off of their head. You know, they had an end, lander liner in the steel helmet. They tore the steel part off, trying to bail water because the boat's pumps wouldn't, uh, sump pumps wouldn't keep the water out. It was coming over the sides and everywhere. I was busy throwing that and wading in. From the splash coming over. The wading in the vomit and everything too, you know, so it wasn't very pleasant. So there was a lot of vomit in your yeah. in your landing craft? Yeah. Oh yeah. I was sick, but uh, you know, I, I can't say yes, I did vomit. No, I didn't. I don't remember. You might have. Because <clears throat> when we got so close in, everybody had to be in and their jackets and everything ready to fight. So I had to be hooked up in my flamethrower seat. And now, do you remember your exact position in the landing craft? Well, sure, in the, in the little landing boat. Yeah, I remember it right well. Boat had a, on the inside of it, had a bench down each side and one down the middle. That's what we lined up on. Now most of these guys are, well I won't say all, most of them, a lot of them were uh, standing up into the back trying to get the nose up where we could get as dry as we could, you see. But I couldn't stand up. I 
because I had the flying throw on my back. One bullet would have took us all out, see. And so I was sitting down under this little ramp on that LCA, which I wasn't used to being there, you see. And I was kind of backed up in there, about the old force from here to the refrigerator there from the front corner. And then when my boat blew, it blew right in the side of me here. I, I, I still remember seeing that part, you see. The exit. Yeah. Uh, right in the side of the boat. I don't know if we hit a mine or, or they hit us. I don't know which it was. I do know that the, I can remember the sound of it was a muffled roar sound. So so your boat got hit on the approach? Yeah, right, Jerry. Yeah, yeah, we were from off grid to touch it out. And that put everyone in there out of commission or? Well, I, I can't say what happened. Oh, you were knocked out? <laughs> Yeah, virtually I was knocked out, but uh, and all of it, and it's a wonder you didn't well, drown. Or I had an assistant flamethrower. We made up the flamethrower group, and after he made it, I know, and well, I know some of it met because we met together up in in Virginia every year on D Day. You know, a bunch of all Captain Company A, in other words. And I, he was from New York, and I ran into him up or about the second one of those that I went to. And he told me then that him and another boy saved my life. And he said what caused him to do it uh, was the first thing he heard was get him out of the flamethrower, get the flamethrower off. Because that would have taken off. everybody out. So, you know, I don't remember that, but, but they got it out. And when uh, I didn't have nothing on except a little old... May West thing I had around my chest. They were trying to get it off you yeah, so it wouldn't blow I reckon, up. I, yeah, they got it off of me. Then, then uh, I don't know where they went from there. So y'all were about to hit the beach yeah. and then maybe hit a mine you suspect it was, right? That's what I believe it was because of the sound of it. And I never heard an artillery shell sound that way, you see. And I had one of them hit close from here at that. And later. per landing craft, is that a platoon or you knew all those guys, right? Yeah, it, well, it was called the boat section. Boat amphibious section. boat section. See, we were turned out from infantry to amphibious, and then when we made our beachhead, we went back into infantry. We still worked similarly a lot. We had certain ones in each squad, certain ones that had uh, done certain jobs, and all this kind of stuff. We all had a position, okay? And, but there was 30 men and, and, uh, and the sergeant and the lieutenant, and I think they had two sailors on there, called them coxswains. Steering it. Yeah, and they were the one carrying us in. So uh, just to kind of get the, your, your specific recollections of it, you know, exact, you're, you're heading on in, Company A, first ones to hit the beach outside of the engineers that weren't we're really able to. Been there. Heading in really close, shells going over. Probably there's a little defense coming out as well from the German positions. Do you remember that at all? Oh yeah, they were falling against the boats. So everything. you were getting dinged, you could hear it. Yeah, they, well that of course it's hard for me to remember you see. but. Uh, but do you know they, they were returning fire? Going down, we thought we had it way. We thought we'd go just walk in for the stuff that was coming down. All them bombs. Now they told us it's supposed to be about a about a hundred and twenty thousand pounds or bombs dropped on from water's edge eleven hundred yards inland. See all of that I learned in England what they was gonna do. That would leave us some bomb craters on the beach for places to get in and would also take a lot of the defense out. And when we got there, it had not been touched. Only thing that had touched was what the Navy had fired in there. That day? and Or just right before? Yeah. and uh, So you're approaching close to the beach. Your landing craft probably hits a mine. Um, you get knocked unconscious. Uh, 
some people around you, maybe while the boat's sinking, or was it still afloat? Or... I, I don't know where it went. Because <laughs> you, were, you were knocked out. Yeah, well, when, when I tell about where I could see it, and I hate to say I was knocked out, but I don't, I just can't remember that. You hit a mine and it was a haze, basically. Uh, and one thing I remember was a guy laying about 12, 15 feet in front of me to the side over here, you see. But he, he was dead, I could tell pretty well tell that because it, I, I just stared at him a minute, you know, and he didn't move and his face was away from me. From so your I, landing I, craft? I, I don't know where it come from uh, by that time, but uh, I like to think that he hit with me to get me in, but anyway, I, I just, just like to think that for it does be good. So. So how far, that body and, and yourself, were you floating or were you close enough no, to land? No, I, I was on sand all right, water was coming up around my feet, I guess. So, so you were pretty close when the mine happened. Oh, yeah, and when, because uh, tide, you know, was rising fast, I think they said about a foot or a hour, or a foot a minute, I believe they said. So, the leg's not working like it's supposed to see it. I wasn't was see hurting in my back or anything, but I kept trying to figure why I couldn't move them. And I worked around where I could get my hand back there to see it, you know, and I couldn't find anything. And I'd take my arms and try to pull in the sand and I'd just dig in. I, I couldn't pull them away. Were there rounds going off around you? or All everywhere, everywhere all around everywhere and matter of fact you just got where you didn't try to dodge from <laughs> just, that's any it. places as good as the next and of course them what you see was a lot of the men that didn't make it in because put out in the water over their heads and they're floating out there and so your landing craft close gets hit by mine in the scramble afterwards, they get the flamethrower off of you. You're a little incapacitated from something. You're not exactly yeah. sure. Yeah. And you're cr you crawled. Trying to get on in, you know. But it, closer up the beach. But. Without your flamethrower, obviously, because they yeah, had taken it off. Didn't have anything. No gun, nothing. Nothing with a, 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 a combat knife and a 45 pistol that I carried with the flamethrower, see. Did you draw them, or? Well, I couldn't use that a pistol no, I couldn't hit the side of a barn with it, but uh, I just carried it because I had to have some kind of weapon along with the flamethrower. Of course, soon as soon as I emptied the flamethrower, well, I'd, my rifle, I'd get my rifle and go again. Not necessarily my rifle, any rifle they handed me, I'd go again. But uh, so you. You saw him struggling. Oh yeah, he was well. He was unconscious, of course, but you just but he was still breathing enough to know he's still alive. Was that the two, you know, unfortunately gruesome sights you saw? Was the one body over to the side, and then the sergeant on the way back that you can kind of recall vividly? Oh yeah, I can recall that, uh, and. When they got me aboard, they pulled, I remember they dragged me over in, in the boat. Well, I seen all of those and there wasn't nobody talking much or anything, you know, but uh, I recognized the sergeant anyway because he's uh, one of our boat sergeants. Do you remember his name? I know his name well, but it takes me a while to dig it up. <laughs> yeah, so, he's, he's buried up in Virginia, they brought him back. So without any kind of weapons or anything, you were just kind of in this area right off the beach after your boat hit the mine. Second or third wave or something swings in and, and takes you out. Uh, yeah. Were you able to t take stock of your injuries? Kind of what 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 did they end up being? Uh, I don't know. Uh, time I got back aboard ship, I could I could drag along with a couple of. Happy, you know. So it was your legs mainly that were. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, couldn't walk or. Then, no, by the time I got back to England, I could. We got back to England about uh, oh, somewhere around midnight, I would say. Same day. Yeah. Well, yeah. He he had just went back to get another load to to Plymouth, and 
they put all of us off. The British was not allowed to treat us or anything. If they wouldn't even give us a Band-Aid. <laughs> well, come with some of the guys wanting something, you know, headed or so, aspirins or something, but they told us that they was not allowed to touch us medically. Now, I don't want to, I have no idea what a silly thing like that was about, but anyway, when we got back over there, they, <clears throat> they unloaded us on the docks, and, and uh, they was, had a girl Air Force outfit from Britain was up, they just a block or so up, they come and got us and took us up, <coughs> took us up there and called First Army Headquarters and of course they was down there by daylight and got us. Do you remember when you were able to regain your ability to walk? Well, it was during that period of time. By the time I got back up there I could walk without help except I was just hopping pretty bad on the right leg wouldn't do what I wanted it to you know was it in pain were you in pain uh, were you in pain not much hmm. not a whole lot of pain not you know that's I, weird it just I, must have knocked your joints out of place or something so anyway they was trying to get all that was able to go back because uh, what the uh, Commanding officer, of, I don't know, remember his rank, but he was an officer, was talking to us, us boys that was able to walk, about how bad they needed us because we had the training, and they was running fresh guys in there, you know, and, and they needed us over there real bad. But if I wanted to go on to the hospital, they'd send me on up there to see if they could what's wrong with my leg and everything. But I told him, we'd, well, another boy in me that was from the boat section, uh, Graham Reynolds, Corporal, we told him, well, we'll just go back to the outfit. So the same boat loaded down there, and the time they loaded, they put us right back on the was, side. Was this all the HMS, and tell me the name again, that British ship? Uh, was this all the same British ship? Uh, the same one. What was it called again? It had a weird name. Yeah, the uh, Javelin. It was the Javelin. Empire, so Empire Javelin. Javelin so took you over first, so took you back, and then took come, you right see, back. When he come back to get a load, they put us in that load and we went back. And so, I, mean, I was gone, I think, six or seven days, I'm not sure which. Back in England. Uh, no, back to my company. Uh, from the time, from D-Day, about, about D-6 or D-8, 7 or something like that, then I rejoined the company. Were you surprised? And again, you know, like you said, and, and I think has been recorded, Company A took very heavy casualties. Were you kind of surprised at uh, what, had been, what had happened to it? Well, of course, I didn't know all that had happened, you know, but... Because uh, you were taken out of commission I, pretty I, quick. I, yeah, and uh, I do know when I got back that the, uh, the, the boat sergeant uh, made it through, and uh, the lieutenant made it through, Lieutenant Garin and uh, Sergeant Roy Stevens. And you're just, a, you're, you're ranked a private through all oh, this. Yeah. Well, when you hit combat, you're automatically a PFC. <laughs> okay. So, First class, yeah. Yeah, and uh, so uh, I know they made it back and Graham Reynolds. So that was out, out of my boat section, but that's all, that's all I knew of at that time until after the war when I got acquainted with my assistant flamethrower. Um, was that their verdict too, that it was a mine? Was everybody's kind of agreement that it was a mine that you hit, not like a mortar shell or? I don't know that they ever even discussed it. As I remember, they they'd just say whatever hit us. It was and, some kind of explosion. Yeah, and I know my heart sergeant has, after the war, had to have it saying they either hit us or we hit them, whatever. <laughs> That's just his way of doing it. <clears throat> so. But they, they was there and all, all the, well, it wasn't a half a company anyway, but we were still working under company headquarters. And uh, so they... 
So what did you, so you went right back, obviously the, the, that first section of beach had been taken yeah. by the time you got back. Um, kind of, how did things unfold for you? I mean, you went, you went back to England, but then you went right back. Um, were you involved in their march through France right afterwards? No. <laughs> I'll see if they hadn't seen anything. Well, I meant, I meant, oh, yeah, you know, when you got back, what did you start? Uh, to? All the way through uh, till the September. Well, I was taken out one time for 21 days under another list, carried back to England again. But uh, uh, So where did yeah. you go first after the Normandy Beach? I know there was a bunch well, of towns right back there. Right up there, just, uh, uh, it wasn't about a mile or a mile and a half off of the beach at the most, at the most, when we got back. And uh, I don't know where Graham went. He went to a different part of the company or something. But anyway, uh, the sergeant that was in charge, I didn't know him. He was a new one. Uh, and But uh, he... he and uh, he asked me, said, uh, said, didn't you come in? I said, yeah, D-Day. And so he said, well, here, take this boy with you and keep him with you. He said, because this is his first trip. And I told him, all right. So, well, they had re-equipped us at First Army Headquarters. With rifle. So with, and took off the old dirty impregnated clothes for impregnated for gas and give us regular uniform. Of course our, our commander wouldn't let us in anything but class A uniforms to fight. So that was And you obviously thing. now had a rifle to oh, defend yeah, yourself. I had, I had to put a load, full load of the rifle of everything I needed. Didn't so the flamethrower was a very temporary thing. That was just the D Day and then I didn't fool with it no more. <laughs> no no uh, <laughs> Most of them there didn't know I was flying through, so I didn't bother to tell them. And, well, it was a suicide job. I knew that one would put it on. Every one of us knew it was a suicide job. And so... Were the people that you knew, uh, you probably knew some of the other flamethrowers, were they unfortunately maybe didn't make it through D-Day or...? Well, I, I don't, couldn't tell you who they were even because they was in a different boat section and each boat section was a little outfit by itself. We were supposed to be able to travel by ourselves. And you were the only flamethrower well, besides your assistant? Well, my section, every section had a flamethrower. We were supposed to have a flamethrower. And What was your, so say things had gone ideally, were you supposed to do some of the, uh, uh, Put the flame into some of the bunkers on the beach, or yeah, I seen it the other day. <laughs> where we landed on the sand tables, just where you're up above high tide, see, back in there was a gun emplacement, okay, and it wasn't too big, but. According to what they told me, it was reinforced concrete. The German positions. Yeah, German position far and across the beach. And I was supposed to get him within the first 30 minutes. That was my direction to carry, follow. And then if I had fuel left, I was to go angling from that back up almost to the top of the hill up there, a huge gun emplacement up yep. there. And I was supposed to take it if I had the fluid left and, and the assistant was carrying an extra set of tanks of fluid. And I was supposed to try to burn that out. Now you called it a, a suicide job. Mm -hmm. Were you surprised that you came through? Well, I don't really know how to answer that. Uh, Obviously, you're grateful for well, it. Well, of course, I, I, grateful enough. I didn't volunteer to carry a flamethrower again, but uh, you did. You did your job and and uh, yeah, didn't want to fool with me. I done what I was supposed to, or what I tried to do. What I was supposed to. I I, I fault myself a whole lot, which is not my fault. Did you did you volunteer for flamethrower or get assigned? Uh, did you volunteer as flamethrower or did you get assigned 
to well, it. Well, they don't don't take volunteers there with us. It was they told you what to do. That's yeah. your job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I just went ahead and took it and went out and. I fired it twice before. We just did it just Practice. shortly before. Uh, encounter, and, and you'll probably say, of course, did you ever encounter combat situations against the Germans while you were in France? Three times a day, I guess. Three times a day. <laughs> they were hedgerow was a, was a main line resistance for them. When we got to overpowering them, they backed up to the next one. Then we had to take that one, so every one of them was a was a battle roll all through there for the first oh for the first weeks. Do you remember like coming face to face where you can recall taking out enemies or? Well, yeah, you come eyeball to eyeball. Sometimes you had bayonets on and all this kind of stuff, you know. So did you have to, you know? I don't talk. Oh, uh, don't talk about it. No. Yeah. Uh, let me tell you something, that people think it's fun to, to the guy that takes a, a life. It's that moment it is. Two hours later, you know. Kind and of with, uh, coping with, with so what you've just had to do. It, it's. It, yes, we're bound to have to do that because it's him or me, see. So, and now, I'll tell you what I've told a half a dozen people. People don't realize what a combat soldier is. First thing he has to become is full of hate. The next thing he has to become, wanting to kill. Okay, now if he don't, if he's not that, he's not a combat soldier. That is absolutely necessary. So that's what they do to the young man that goes in there. That's what they make out of them, fighters. And and you uh, kind of felt that going in against, and, and probably right, you know, obviously rightfully so, against the Nazi regime and takeover of Europe is. Yeah. You had been. Um, you had seen the coverage, you had known what's going on. Obviously the full scope of what they did was not, had not come to light yet, but you had that in you ready to do what you needed to do. Come in training, you see, they trained it. Put it in his heart, like I told you, 24 hours a day. And so by the time I got there, well, into combat, well, well I was just a combat soldier. And uh, if I seen a man, I shot at him, if, hoping he didn't see me. And uh, all that kind of stuff, you know. And, and sometimes we'd have to go put them onto the hedgerow before they'd leave. Of course, we had hand grenades and things like this with us that we could toss a hand grenade over the hedgerow and kind of clear us out a spot to go over. And, we tried at the start with We didn't know how to fight it in that kind of territory because that kind of territory wasn't in England. They were field lined with a hedgerow, and all of them was a battle. And now a lot of guys I've you know and I've done several talked with several veterans. A lot of them were in kind of more support roles behind, whether it was in the Navy, you know, off on D-Day whether it was on France, uh, behind the front lines. It sounds like you were very involved in the front lines we was the from rifle. the get-go. We was the rifle company, the very leaders. We had uh, D Company the, of, of, of our outfit was carrying heavy weapons, that is uh, Artillery. 81 millimeter mortars and things like that. They fought over our head, over us. That, so they was back here. And Did you feel kind of a special responsibility of being that front line spearheading and, and got to where that I didn't feel anything hardly. Uh, I didn't know what day of the week it was. Didn't care. Didn't go talk about time of day, but it's twenty four seven. We was out to be in battle at two o'clock in the morning. If it was at eight o'clock, it didn't matter, you know. So. 
and for your frontline soldier, you, you know, I've read a whole lot of things too where they talk about, oh, on such and such a day, such and such a time, at such and such a little place, this happened to me and all this. I didn't know any of that stuff. I didn't, I didn't know what time of day it was. I don't know, well, I know what, what that I took the shrapnel on, on uh, May the 2nd. The only way I know that is because I got my medical records. I got a copy of them after I come out, and that's when I learned what day and everything. It was. That was in the training accident when you took the shrapnel. Yeah, some shrapnel and stuff. I'd gone 21 days that time and come back. But so sorry, I. Uh, uh, so that wasn't the training accident when. You, so the the shrapnel. I think you had said May. When, when, when did that happen, the, sh the shrapnel that took you out 21 days? It was in the battle for St. Lowe. St. Lowe. So that would have been not May, but uh, what, July or August? Because well, you know, D-Day was June. July is what I'm trying to think July, of. July, July. And uh, it's it the second day of July that, uh, that my records show. And... Uh, so in this Battle of St. Lo, that's that's when you had taken the shrapnel and were put out for 21 days. For for the 21 days, they took me back to England. The, uh, the fractures, well, I have one to come through this arm, it caused a whole lot of blood, but the others wasn't that bad. They could have patched me up. I could still use this arm, but it would just kept bleeding. And if... They could have patched me up and I could have stayed over there as far as that part was concerned, as far as the seriousness of what they had done to me there. And, but, uh, well, I'll just go ahead with the rest of the story on it. By this time, I was company runner and I'd been back and picked up some uh, K rations for some guys. We was on a holding position while they was trying to work on down on the other side of St. Lo. We was up on the east side. and uh, Looking up, down into the town. Yeah, we was up on top of that. Uh, well, I found out later when I went back over there, it was a Martinville Ridge where the road, little old road was. And that's where you were stationed, Martinville yeah, Ridge. Yeah, that's, that's where we was, at. we was in hold up there while they was trying to catch up everything, get ready. And I carried them out. We always put a, a guard out in front of us, about four or five hundred yards out in front of the main line of resistance, out there to draw fire in case they'd come in on a counterattack that would catch us. That was a technical way we looked at it. So when I start to take that out, that's all under sniper fire and everything like that between us. And Sergeant hollered at me and said, Pick it, take it on out there and stay with them tonight, and I'll send you a replacement. The morning says they ain't got before out there, and they need five. I said okay, so I crawled around, and got it all out there, all right, and, and been there about well less than two hours. When uh, you, know, you know the hedgerows, small this was a smaller field, and we would had a. Foxhole this way, looking this way, and one in this the corner, looking this way, in a corner. So I was in this, and it looked down this way, and uh, about, I'd say, I'd say better than 20, somewhere between 20 and 30 Germans come over that hedgerow now, what, uh, and immediately when you see them, you know what they are. They are combat patrol, if it's that size. Otherwise, just got three or four, it's just a recon patrol. That we knew was combat, but they didn't know he was there. So we was first to open fire on them, and we, and we had a pretty good battle, and then, but uh, then I took this route one. Was that from a uh, grenade or from a round? Uh, 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 was it from an artillery round, or? No, just from hand grenades and what they're carrying with them, you see. It was a hand grenade. Yeah, we had hand grenades. And that's a hand grenade got me. But, uh, of course, I was still working because it hadn't, hadn't stopped me, you see, until the blood kept running, and I thought I'd better try to do something. And I told this, punch this guy, and I said, I'm going to sit down. I, I sat down and ripped my sleeve off. <laughs> this was obviously after the battle was over. No. Oh, still going on. Still going. And... Uh, I had to jerk my 
little old packet that had a bandage in it, you know, and got it on her, got with teeth trying to tighten it hard enough to stop the blood a little bit, you know, because it was blood bleeding pretty bad. And I couldn't get it stopped, but I got it cut down a little, and so I just I just got back on up and stayed, kept working, and because there wasn't enough of us out there. He said, how many was it? Four besides, five of total. Five total. Fighting that Taking many on people. Taking on about right? 20, 30. So it took us a while to make change their mind down there, and... and so they eventually retreated because you had the well, advantage Well, what of them was position. able. What of them was able to live. And uh, maybe, maybe sell braids of them, went back over the hedge road and left. And, but, and my being company runner, uh, kind of my duty was to do a body count. But I was bleeding so bad, and of course they they forgot them because they the stopped was trying to help me stop the blood. None of, none of those could get it stopped for some reason. I know, I've never figured out why. But uh, so I told them, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to count. You guys can count it and turn it in if you will. I'm going. The number of Germans? Yeah, that was that was laying in the field, whether dead or alive, and all that kind of stuff. Call all of them, but dead. But, uh, Were y'all able to take any prisoner I, or? Well, I don't know what they done with them. What they, well, I just don't know. Mm -hmm. Soldiers do different when they get so bad condition. If they're mad enough, they just shot him iron. They, don't, they think the American soldier wouldn't do that, but he would. And, but anyway, I, I, my idea was to get back to the MLR at the main company back there where our, our medic was, you see. We had a medic with us in each company that I run into as soon as I got back there. He said, he got hit a couple hours ago. He's gone. He's not here. I said, well, how am I going to get this one to stop running? So he tried, he couldn't, and he said, the only thing I can tell you to do is get back to battalion aid station. Another long walk. And you're by yourself, right? Yeah. And so, uh, well, cause there's all holding positions too, you see. And the old boy that I, that he had given me, you know, the, the one the sergeant told keep with him, at, he seen me as I was going out. He started cussing me, calling me everything. You don't have just to get, get to go out cutting up, you know, just cutting up and playing. I was thinking you were taking yourself out, but you yeah, were bleeding pretty bad. Accusing me of doing that, of getting it done so I'd get out a while and all that stuff. That's all he was doing, so I just went on off and left him. When I got back there, finally, it was it was getting pretty dark. and. I remember I was just struggling to walk. Loss of blood. And was, was staggering and almost falling and everything, and I was trying to keep going. And they seen me and run out there and got me and took me on in. That must have been a really trying time, just walking, trying to find a medic all by yourself, going from position to position, trying to find a medic. Yeah, knowing that bleeding that bad wasn't good for you. And but they uh, they checked me out back there and then kind of got to a tourniquet on it where it would stop. So you finally found a medic? Yeah, well, at the, at, at the battalion aid station, it's just a small aid station to in between us. And so they had a, a jeep with a windshield let down and a stretcher tied on it and a man on the stretchers. And uh, they took me and tied me into the back seat where I wouldn't fall out, you see, had me tied. And I held to, with this hand a bottle of plasma, they called it, that he was going in. That guy, he was unconscious while they took us on back. So you were with a bunch of other injured folks along, mm -hmm. you were with other injured along the way to receive yeah, treatment. Yeah, that one, they carried us on back to the collecting station back there to a little bigger place. And when I got back there, well, I don't know exactly what they did with me. I know that they, that I woke up a time or two and then 
the next morning, they was one of the. They told me that it would be next morning before they could put me to sleep to take that out, you know. And the next morning, well, I, I clambered up. I could get up a little bit. Well, they offered to feed me, but then about the time I got with food, they hollered at me not to take it because it's fixing to put me to sleep. So from now You're probably pretty hungry. Well, yeah, I had at least eaten nothing the day before. <laughs> My rations were still over. And, but uh, next thing I knew after they put me to sleep, I woke up tied up in a C-47, a stretcher, bound with a rope <laughs> all the way around, shoes sitting up on my chest. And they flew you back to England. Yeah, and I, I roused up enough that there happened to be a porthole close to it, and I, I seen down on seen water and went back out again. I didn't know any more than until the plane landed. When Were landed, there other injured on the plane with you? Huh? Were there other injured on the plane with you? Full of them. They kept them tied full, all of the balls tied full of stretchers, it's full of them. So when it hit, the old planes, you know, this line, <laughs> old C-47s. Boy, you went through some I rough woke, times. I woke up at that time then, and of course, it took them a while to get me to, to my stretcher to take down and everything, and then they come and got it, carried me in. But, um, and I, I kind of feel like that that might be the reason I had to stay over the 21 days was loss of blood. Now, now that I've been got sense enough to think about it, you see. Do you still have, to your, this day, do you still have fragments? I have I had a small one about that big that it was stayed in there, but it, it, and according to what they told me, was that they didn't take it out because it had to go through from this side to get it to my arm more damage than it would to leave it in there. Yeah, because I know that at some points, yeah, leaving it in there doesn't really hurt you. Yeah, and oh. I, I've lost it now. I can't. Oh, find it so, I, so I think sometimes maybe it works. It's yeah, finally find. works its way out. So you, but did that? Uh, I mean. Did you always, have you viewed that or, you know, maybe it's gone now, but did you view that for a long time as bringing home a piece of the war? Well, it, 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 bothered, German... me. it bothered me too. If you get against it back here, it didn't bother you and everything. And so it weakened the army just a little bit for a long time, but, but I've always been one to exercise, so I'll keep it built back up. But, but it, you're obviously uh, probably right-handed, so at least it oh, was yeah, your non, yeah. non-dominant. Yeah. So uh, you fly back to England. What what city were you in a hospital in for 21 days? Was it I Plymouth? I don't know the name of the city. 186 General Hospital. 186 General Hospital. 21 days, and then are you the one who instigates? Okay, I'm ready to go back. Or they had to dismiss you or discharge you rather. Oh, Captain, is they put me in an officer's ward because it was crowded and I was a walking patient. Okay. So I was at the old captain that come in there, he's a, he a big cusser, he cussed everybody that's up to him. Just cutting up, you know. And uh, he come in there and when about time for me to go, uh, he said, well, you're good for another round. You get out of here and go on back. I don't want to see you anymore, he said. So, <laughs> I was talking to one of the nurses. She had walked me down to the ambulance to take me back out. And he said, especially you and her standing around here together, you ain't supposed to do that. It's just going on at me, you know, because we had already talked that over when I walked her back to her barracks a time or two before I got down, before I got loose to go. And she's just friends now. As a matter of fact, I stayed pen pal with her for once until I come out of the service. But it was never any more than just walking along talking. And we, we just took to like it to each other. And I, 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 when I got where I could, I had her address. When I got where I could, I wrote, got back with her when I come out of combat. Sounds like you were able to keep track of a lot of these folks who you met along the way. Well, uh, I was a bigot for pen pals for all the time that I could get loose to have pen pals to write to. I enjoyed that for some reason. Of course, being a country boy and all this, but uh, so 21 days, 
captain says you're ready to go yeah. back, and yeah. you're probably ready to get yeah. out of there. So I went on back, and then I got knocked out in September. So hold on, when, uh, when you, okay, so 21 days, you're headed back to France. Did you, were you able to rejoin Company A? Yeah, or? yeah. So you stayed with Company A your whole time in service. Well, they have a place in my records that, that is listed as K Company, but now I've never been there. I was in A Company, I know, and I, I, I'm thinking that was a typo because it, it, But from what you remember, from D-Day on, Company A. And you probably had a lot of replacements maybe coming in oh, to fill we, those. We, we was totally wiped out three times. And I was with it. One time we had 14, one time we had 17, another time 27 for the whole company. With the, with the, the time we was 17, we had a, a corporal company commander. <laughs> He's the only officer we had. So, but they kept putting replacements to keep oh, company yeah, A going. Yeah. Yeah, you know, that time uh, the 300 radio had been up, had been up there with us. Now you say 14. Were you the last kind of original to stick with Company A, or do you, you, it'd be hard to maybe to By tell? By the time I left over there, there was nobody else from Company A in there. There's all replacements, and uh, so nobody from Company A there at all. So when you went back after the 21 days in hospital, uh, where did, do you remember where you met back up with Company A at? Like a town? Just or? beyond Hunt St. Low. So they hadn't, in those 21 days, it was yeah, okay. slow going. Show you on the map where it is. I forgot maps that I love to read those. But they had taken St. Low and, and were now beyond yeah. it. Okay. Yeah, they had taken St. Low and I think they took it. See, I was hit on the 2nd and St. Low fell on the 18th. And July second is when you were hit. St. Lowe was a kind of a breakthrough, so they moved out a little ways, and I went on down with them from there through through Bre I mean through Veer, which is another pretty big battle. And after that, why well, when I come out of that, why well, they took us up into the Brittany Peninsula to take us down to Brest, so that's where they knocked me out. So you're marching through. You return. They've taken St. Lowe. You march through Veer. Uh, make it up to Brest, and we didn't, um, we didn't march through, we or not march rather, we just, just kind of like fought, yeah, fought through all encompassing <laughs> took, terms. So. Took the same hill out there twice, and as a matter of fact, we got a presidential citation for taking that hill. Our, our, our at, battalion did at Veer or St. Lo or which one? Veer. 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 Okay. I happened to get up there to see the monument that they put up to my outfit, first battalion. Come and so you're you you're fighting through France. You make it to Brest, and what happens there? Uh, that that this is this is September '44, right? What happens at uh, that town? That was considered about next to the D-Day. Now what they had told us on the way up there, they, was, they had to haul us up there. When the Veer battle was over, they loaded us up with, with two other divisions and formed the Ninth Army to go in there and help take Brest. They said that they had about 20,000 people hemmed up in there that couldn't get out by air, water, or lands. Hemmed Encircled. Up. And that, well, it was a big, uh, uh, Submarine port, you see, and they couldn't. Get, they had people up there fighting them, but they couldn't take them. They couldn't do nothing with them. For the Montbury fortress, when they knocked me out, they knocked me out on the 16th, and that thing fell on the 18th. The Rebs give up on the 18th. You keep uh, you keep put getting put out right before the the towns fall in the. And, and the battles are yeah. won. It sounds yeah. like, yeah. Um, yeah. but uh, was it was it a uh, mortar round or do you remember what it was? Or, or? just artillery shells? Or was it one? Maybe one of the big ones. I don't know, but it was strong. Whatever it was. Were you in a foxhole at the time? Just, just jumping at them when they started it. You see, and then you look over and see the foxhole coming in. You don't know no more to. So they the the shelling started on the sixteenth. You you run and jump in a foxhole. 
and uh, the fox hole coming on me <laughs> from the blast. Well, obviously, since you survived, it wasn't a direct hit, but it was. Well, I, I did. Yeah, I, the only thing that I could remember from, from that part, for that part, was that it just seemed like I thought this is it. See. Because it's coming in. Now I don't know. I might have been a handful of dirt. I don't know. A shovel full or something. But that was, was when I woke up, that was all I could remember about it. Because I woke up in England, they said 12 days later. You were really knocked unconscious this time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Was this the, and you know, I know a lot of times things are a little bit hazy, but was this the only time you were like really blacked out to where you had no idea? Yeah, yeah I didn't know anything to the, I woke up there, my nurse standing by the bed. In England. And uh, I, I was confused, of course, and couldn't talk for a little bit. When I finally got where I could talk, I asked her, you know, natural question, where am I at? So out, outside of Brest, you've got positions outside. Germans start shelling. You run to jump in your foxhole. You make it to the foxhole, right? But yeah. still a mortar catches yeah. you and knocks you out. As, as I went in, it went in with me, but uh, no, it wasn't necessarily my foxhole. It's, it's just just foxholes all over the place up through there, because like I told you, every field was a fight. And uh, where we got stopped long enough, we scratched out a foxhole if we could, and long we stayed there, the deeper it got. So, and I don't know whose foxhole it was because we was on a move. Mm -hmm. And uh, now was uh, because of this, you know, you being at the front lines and and being injured a few times. Was Veer the only town you were able to see through with the capture of and taking of? Yeah, Veer was. Well, uh, I could see all of, of Saint Lo, and then I traveled through it to catch up after it had been taken. Yeah, after it was taken. And, uh, but Veer, that probably felt pretty good, your first victory that you could be there for as far as a captured town. Well, it was a rough deal. The, 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 we had a small mountain to us, but it was a mountain, and it just about like a mule's face climbing it, you see, and they had it totally covered up there, the Germans did, and our outfit went in there and finally got them beat out. And when we got them beat out to run off of the a mountain, well, late that evening, uh, they come and, and brought us back off of the mountain to guard the bridge down there in Veer. And so, nobody there to guard it. So they brought us back down there. We had to take the silly thing again next day. So that's that's the reason they put up the monument to there. So basically, the, the folks who had taken Veer, you and others, yeah. They needed somebody to guard a bridge that pulled you out of here. Yeah. Germans moved yeah. back in, and you had to go take it again. Yeah, yeah. Probably. Now, if you ever find a, a, a book, and he wrote one uh, uh, of now uh, oh, I made his name leave me, and no, I remember it well because I'm associated with him. He was from D Company of our, our outfit. There, the division, which was heavy weapons, see, and he wrote a article on that. Uh, Veer. Well, uh, I know his name to come to me in a minute because I, I knew him well even after the war. Well, he was a big one that was the man leading the force on putting in the D-Day thing in, in Bedford. He was from Bedford. And he, he wrote an article on it to kind of explain some of that there. So breast taken out uh, outside of it two days before it falls. Unconscious for 12 days, I think you said. Uh, wake up, uh, what, hos same hospital or? No, it was uh, the uh, 101st, 101st General Hospital. And Unrelated to the 101st Airborne, that just happened to be the, the name. Uh, that just happened to be the name. Yeah, just, of, be uh, just the number of the hospital. Uh, Is this what finally took you out for good from the war? Or? Yeah, well, it was full of guys that was kind of in my shape. <laughs> oh, you were what you'd consider pretty bad shape at that point? Well, or? of course it was. They uh, uh, kept me under lock and key for a matter of two or three weeks. What were the, uh, what were the injuries specifically? Now, the, 
as far as knowing what they's doing, I don't. I've talked to doctors since then, and they've given me what they think about it, you know. I talked with one psychiatrist limitly, and he would explain what it was. Had been a head head injury, right? Uh, to knock, it had to been a head injury, right? To knock you total like, nervous breakdowns. What he said it was total, complete nervous breakdown. They put me to sleep, wake me up, put me right back to sleep for two solid weeks. And but you obviously don't remember that. Uh, you don't remember that? All, all the part I remember is when they'd give me the stuff to drink, tasted like gin. <laughs> I remembered <laughs> a little old shot glass and I took that and gone. Help with the pain, maybe. And But they kept it up that way until... Then also, this I remember, they, they after I become, they woke me back up and trying to get me over what they'd done to me. Well, they had pulled, they pulled the death curtains on me twice. You know, one of them places they pulled a curtain all the way around your bed. They could you really see were in bad shape. Because you're going to ward your other people, you see. You really were in bad shape. And I'd, I'd get better and get up and move the thing myself. <laughs> you were. I could remember that so well. And so that they thought you were in worse shape than you thought you were. Well, I never was one to give up. Uh, I still don't give up, and like I tell them all the time, give up, but don't give up. Uh, when you give up, you're gone. And now, did you think that, you know, and, and speaking of not giving up, did you think that you were going to get back into it, or did you know that this was kind of the end of, of you going and fighting in Europe? No, I fully expected I was going to get well and go, so... It, uh, but did you stay in that same hospital for the duration of the Europe no, front? I stayed in Arkham about Christmas, a little after Christmas, and they took me over to a place then uh, uh, called it American School Center. And uh, I don't really took me over there to try to train me, I reckon, in something else, because all I knew was infantry. And for some reason, uh, the bunch that I went with, they went off and left me there, and I stayed there, uh, well, it wasn't there, but a matter of a month anyway, not more than that. What were they going to try to train you as? You well, uh, anything they could get me to do, really. Kind of a so maybe desk duty? I just or... couldn't seem to accomplish what they figured I should. and and. Uh, so they marked me Z.I. to send me a zone of interior and or UK. And so the major wanted to send me home and, and another boy and myself at about my same age, about the same condition, we was talking about it and we didn't want to come home till the war was over. See, I'm still 19 years old. Yeah, I was about, I, I can't believe, wow, <laughs> only 19. And I, I had been putting you in early 20s, but sure. you're still a teenager. Sure. I didn't, didn't have much sense. He never, he hardly wanted So we got talking to him, but we didn't want to come home. He said, well, we can't retrain you. And there's nothing you can do. So when you'd help, it wouldn't be no help to us or anybody. So you and finally I did. said, you might as well go home. So we told him, well, he could give us a job around the hospital or anything to work until the war was over. You and wanted to be there for the yeah, conclusion. Yeah, wanted to be there for when it was over, to come home after. And so he, he found a hospital down there and come back and told us, we're talking to me directly at that time. He said, uh, what it is, you could work in this hospital down there for anything they want you to do, just, just your order or whatever, if you want to do that. And I said, well, I'll do it. And he said, well, good, because you're supposed to stay close to a doctor at all times. You're supposed to eat five times a day and all of this junk, you say. He said, so he said, that'll be an ideal place for me. So that's where I, I wound up with that hospital come home with it. Uh, what was the hospital name? It was the 
61st, 61st General Hospital. Do you remember which city? Uh, Do you remember which city it was in? Uh, well, it was uh, between two little villages. Uh, one of them was called Philkins. Did it mean a near, lot? Near Sarncester. After seeing so many injuries and so many awful things, did, was it something special to be able to help these young people get better working in that hospital and contributing? Yeah, yeah, I got in the... Well, we wasn't hard to cable taking care of herself, really. When all was said and done, I can see that now. I couldn't see it there. But I, there was another one with me that I would stay on this officer's ward and keep it mopped and cleaned up 24 hours, 12 to 12, and then he'd take the next one out of the office. See, we just sort of went 24-24 between us. So, so you were pretty much serving as an orderly at the hospital? Yeah, just more or less. And of course the officers and all the walking officers, they done as much of the work as I did and all that. Was the hospital pretty filled up? Because the battle is still at raging that time, in it was, At that time it was coming down. It was already coming down. It was closing it up. Oh, okay. Well, they went down that night and Provost Marshall calling out the next morning. You bit, so you, basically you got pulled off uh, uh, German guard duty because you were a little too rough with them. Uh, yeah, yeah. And so he told me, he started fussing at me, the provost, more he's a captain, he started fussing at me. I said, Captain, I don't want to hear any argument out of you. I was there trying to guard people that shot me now and cut me up like they have, and you think I'm going to pat them on the head? I said, I ain't going to do it. If you give me the chance, I won't do it again. But they didn't let you? He said, you don't get a rifle anymore. Oh, you had a rifle keeping, <laughs> I'll be darned. <laughs> Just in case one started running, because it wasn't in that old old one. Model or anything. That was a that was pretty bold of you to talk to a, a captain like I that. I didn't care. I didn't care. I, I was tapped up for him down, you see. So, but I, I, I come on. Of course, he 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 realized it too. You see, I'm sure I'm sure that he just leaned out with me. And so, did you stay working at that hospital through Victory in Europe? Through through VJ Day, I got called. Oh, through Victory in Japan. Uh, you? No, no, VE days, VE. what I meant to say. VE days, I got caught on duty. <laughs> My 24 hours on duty, and the other boy was off. But... Do you remember how you heard that they, the Germans had surrendered? Oh, Lord. Everything that talked said it, everything screamed, screaming. It was the blowing, well, bells were ringing. Through the hospital? Uh, all around it, the little villages around there where you could hear them. Bells are ringing from one village to the other. You probably heard those noises before there was like someone said it formally and you know explained it, and you and you probably knew what it was. Oh when, yeah, I knew what it was. But uh, did you just kind of forget that duty and celebration began, or? No, well, I just sat down with some of the officers and helped them drink up what they had. <laughs> well, you guys probably knew that victory was coming soon. I mean, you know, they were pretty much cornered. Well, we, I didn't realize it was coming that soon until it happened, really. I wasn't completely sure of why they was closing up part of that over there or anything like that. I mean, it, uh, that didn't matter to me anyway, you see. Now, was it, did your hospital, was it only U.S. troops that you received, or was it, well, probably British, too, and Canadians, well, but... Well, even Germans, they had Germans injured. Country. And they had some there, when I first got down there, they uh, they come home in body casts, and, or come back to us in body casts, and I know down there I was trying to wash instruments at the, at the operation room, when they cut one out of a body cast and it's full of maggots. Was the person living? Yeah. But with maggots? Yeah. yeah. But uh, when that, we all started hard and going on, with, and the captain said, no, wait a minute, Germans use them. They put them in there to keep down the infection. 
Oh, so they did it on purpose. The Germans put it in there, put him in the body cast. <laughs> they taken him out. Um, <laughs> did you have any uh, Holocaust victims come through the hospital? No, uh, as civilians, you may know. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, don't remember. Just military. Yeah, just military. So celebration, you know, you're, you're um, injured in September, kind of float through, maybe doing some work, you're at the hospitals, you get assigned to a hospital, you stay there through victory in Europe, um, correct? Mm -hmm. And uh, victory in Europe, there's a big celebration. Do you get sent back home immediately after, or do you help close down the hospital? Or? Yeah. I just, yeah, I didn't. I didn't go to town for anything dancing or anything like that anyway. Uh, You're probably still recovering, I would assume, from your I would, I would say so, yeah. I know, I know this, that uh, when we got back over here that the records was totally messed up and gone. They couldn't... Your personal records? My personal, my, my service records. Of now, the medical records had been preserved and taken care of. But they... But the actual, like... See, you know, I had enough points to get out immediately, but I didn't even know that, you see. Until you're I talking got, about when you were injured, or...? To, to come out of the Army. If you, if you was wounded and everything like that, you had more points, and the more points you had, the quicker you could get out. Because we was in for duration plus six. So you had it for six months, anyhow. But I could have got out straight with with all my wounds. And yeah, stuff you were like hurt. That. Yeah, three times. At least, yeah, three. So, but I didn't know that, and, and uh, evidently they didn't know it down Fort Oglethorpe. Uh, so, how long did you stay in the service? Let's see. I stayed in almost three years, not quite three years. So forty six. Yeah. But you, you came back home first, yeah. probably, what, uh, uh, June? I think it's fourth? December of 45. Oh, wow. Yeah, but it's registered as the 6th of January, 45, and then I was still... 46. Yeah, for, 46. So you were still over there a while after victory in Europe. Oh, yeah, yeah, until we finished closing that place up and then come on. We come home in uh, in July, about the middle of July. When you say close up, make sure that every patient who's still there has received their treatment no, and are able to be discharged. Gone and ready to turn the place back over to England. So you were still caring for people for a while oh, after yeah, the war, yeah. or taking care of the hospital, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, Came back home finally, what'd you say, end of 45, beginning of 46, somewhere in there? Yeah. Came home? I, I believe it was, uh, the discharge they gave me was in, in December of 45, and, but then I got another statement after that, that my time with the Army was, in, it was I believe it was January 6th or 7th of 40. So the, so the closing of the hospital and your discharge from the military went hand in hand. It was right there in the same time. Well, uh, they wasn't treating me as a patient in the hospital at that time. Well, just whatever I needed, of course, it would do, naturally. But, uh, so you made it back home, I bet you're... Uh, you made it back home probably about early 46, back to Saudi Daisy. Yeah. Uh, and I bet your mom was in your other, your siblings were pretty happy to... Oh yeah, of course, uh, when we got back to the state side, they took, we assembled in, in Fort McPherson, Georgia, and then went to Count Cybert, Alabama to break the whole hospital up, see, and that's, uh, I went on to Count Cybert with them, so I could, I come home a time or two in that period of time. Uh, They'd let me. They'd let me hitchhike home or whatever. <laughs> down as far as my sisters in Chattanooga. I never did come on up here. She lived down there, cause I had to go back the next day anyway. See, and but there they tried to run us through the infiltration courses and throw <laughs> the dummy hand grenades and then actually there's 35 of us there that had been through combat. 
And it was almost a joke to come, be doing this kind of simulations. They'd give, they give us orders that we'd be out there the next day, which we'd refuse to go. And <laughs> Probably so, seemed kind of silly after not only having been through the combat, but now the war is over. We wasn't going to do it. We, we just made our, we got together, made up our minds. We were not going to do it, no matter what the commander said. And the command, they told us this evening, well, about doing the time of the day, so it'd be 8 o'clock in the morning, you'll be at the colonel's office for failure to do what he said. But 8 or 9 o'clock in the morning, I shipped out. I <laughs> you you might have uh, finally gotten a disciplinary something got on your to, record. Got back to Fort Oldsort, and they worked up the... Uh, Told me to turn in all my clothes, everything I had, except what I had on, and getting the discharge. So I did. Went up to the separation center, stood in a long line, name wasn't called. So got from up there, all of them was gone but me, and here I stand. I said, Well, where's mine? Oh, he said, You're not, you're, you didn't get one. Discharge. I said, I didn't turn my clothes and everything in. Um, so anyways, you were saying that, uh, uh... They said, they said I was declared essential and I had to stay those 30 days, and I, I knew that wasn't right. So, told me to go back and get some more clothes, so I did. Fooled around the motor pool there with them, and until the next time, I turned them in, and after my 30 days, and I was going through the line, I got about halfway up to there, and, and, a, and a woman standing over the side calling my name real loud and said, come over here a minute. And I said, you come over here, I ain't getting out of line. <laughs> so she came walking over there and said, I want you to sign some papers. I said, I don't want nothing. This man's army's got but a discharge. I want to go home, and that's it. She said, well, if he'll hold your place in line, will you go over here and sign a paper? So I asked him, he said, yeah, I'll hold your place. So I went over and signed that paper for her. Got back in line. Don't know who she was, nothing told about her. But you finally got your discharge. Six, well, I got my discharge, come on home. Six months later, got a letter. I was discharged on a 50% disability my compensation will be on its way. Um, so, do you uh, see still... that woman come to find it out, she was a Red Cross woman. She found it in my records, what had happened to me. See, and then they was all trying to, find, trying to find some records on me. When I was in the hospital, our, the corporal come in one morning, bright and early, with a clipboard in his hand, and sat down by my bed asked me to remember everything I had done since I was pouring in in the Army. Now, you imagine that. Kind of like I'm bugging you about after, right now. <laughs> after what I've been through. And also, we'd sit and talk, and if I remembered something, I'd tell him if I didn't. Now, finally, I asked him, I said, well, tell me what's going on. I don't know what's going on. He said, your records is gone. They messed up. He said, we just don't got a record of you. I but said, well, I did said, you, well, we don't need one. Disability, speaking of, did you have any kind of lasting injury effects from your time in the service? Oh, Lord, yeah. Still. Still. They don't go away. <laughs> they stay with you. I don't know if they'll leave me when they bury me or not. They show him left me before. No, you get used to it. I don't say you get to where you can handle it all the time or anything like that, but most of the time you can uh, turn around and walk off or something. You know, you, you learn to have to learn to be with it because you got it and you're going to have it. With your volunteerism, though, originally getting into the service, you know, putting unemployed, wanting them to draft you, not walking away from Company A when, that, uh, when uh, the commander had offered... It sounded like you were ready to accept all these things and, and do it for the country yeah, when given the opportunity. Well, it was just what I was supposed to do. I, I was always one tried to do what I was supposed to do, 
whether I enjoyed it or not, you see. And that's been my opinion all the way through, is uh, this needs to be done, and I'm here as I'm supposed to be doing it. And take me a real quick, just the rundown of after you got back. So you came home, 46, you're finally discharged. What month? 1946. Was it June or July? Or? And you couldn't buy a job. All the other restaurants too, so I went to education that I didn't have. Or sorry, real quick, which, uh, which month were you discharged in 46? Do you remember? Was it June or July or? Uh, I believe it registers in, in, in December. 46? Yeah. Okay. No, or 45, December 45. Oh, right, right, right. And then it'll carry over a few days into January. Okay, right. So. And uh, what did you do when you came back uh, career-wise? Well, uh, I've got a, the first year, I was wild as a buck anyway. Oh. <laughs> and, uh, well, I really wasn't fit to be around. I'm honest with you. I know, I know I wasn't fit to be around. But they let me stay at, at the Fort Oglethorpe uh, and drive a truck around. I'd drive a garbage truck or jeep or... For the Army? Uh, for the Army for the first year. So, and uh, time we got out there then, I, I tried to find a job. If I filled out an application that had a, word, a line on there that said, are you a disabled veteran? You marked that yes, you might as well throw it in the garbage. You didn't get it. Were you able to eventually find work? Quite a while after, okay, but I know I got to thinking about insurance then for some reason because they had mentioned that my insurance there was out and I tried to buy insurance. I couldn't even buy insurance. And so I was just pretty well put out on the street. Uh, uh, I had married a little old girl and she took off in a few months. and. Just pretty well out on the street then from there on, picking up whatever I could. And Odd jobs. So I went to, went, finally got back in school to, for vocational training. A guy that was in the dome building down there worked for the VA at that time, the only VA you had then, and he helped me to get started on that. So I went back and took a high school course in uh, mathematics automotive training, got my certificate in that, and just as I got my certificate in that, a guy come in wanting so to the school and asked the teacher about somebody for a maintenance mechanic, and he had recommended me, and so I went ahead and went with him, and, and come find it out, they owned a construction company with big equipment, heavy equipment and everything, which I knew nothing about, but I learned with them. I didn't stay with them long anyway, because they were staying out of town and everything, and the boss, the one that run the company, was the son of the owner, and he was, he'd come out of the Navy about in the same condition I was, and he wasn't fit to be around either, so it was, wasn't, nah, Needful that we need to get there, yeah. <laughs> so they, anyway, I quit and come on back home. I was up in Irving, Irving Tennessee. Irving. So I come with, it was a big plumbing company, put in water systems and all kinds of big heavy stuff. And so I took a job with them with uh, Dave L. Brown Company here at Chattanooga. What was the specific? Well, I, I just drove with him. I, I hauled his heavy equipment for a while. Or I mean, what was the what was the company like? What did they do? Uh, what was the company, D Dave Al Brown? Like, uh, what did they do? Oh, road building. Road building. And actually, at the time I went with them, they was repaving the big airport out there. It, that'd be the first big air paving they had done after the war. He was doing that. Chattanooga Airport. Yeah, I'll be yeah. darned. So, and so he so done, you helped with the building of Chattanooga Airport. Yeah, he done all of that kind of work, and uh, and uh, then I I started hauling his heavy equipment from place to place. If he was doing that jobs out of town, I'd take the heavy equipment, move it, 
And so you were hauling heavy equipment there to the site that's now the Chattanooga Airport. Yeah. When it was first being built. The first, the first big, and they had a small one out there, but the first big one that went in there. Is it the same location that it is now? Yeah. Yeah, it's just been added to now with other runways. And so was that kind of the career you settled into? Was construction related? Oh yeah, for for eleven years. With uh, Dave L. Brown. Yeah, and then during that time, my my back and legs was uh, going on down on me and giving me a lot of problems. And I seen I was not going to be able to stay with that, so I started training in something else. I I finally got my feet on the ground. Of course, I was homeless for a while. <laughs> But I'd finally got my feet on the ground and, and thinking, so I trained him. Excuse me. I, no, I take all the time you need, yeah. But I uh, went training, training in electronics and finally got my diploma in that. And like a um, radio and television and stuff. Like, like a kind of a tech uh, diploma or? A technician in it, just. Uh, repair work more than what I was interested in. And Were you able to work that here in Chattanooga? Well, I, was, I opened a little place here in Saudi Davis and stayed in 29 years. Good for you. What was the name of it? Pickett's Television Service. Pickett's Television Service. Everybody was knows it me. Right up here on the main road? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was down here across from the funeral home there for a while, then I moved out to the old grocery store and went out up there, and that's where the when I went out. Is that where you kind of retired? Was well, from it was your... a job that I could, well, my cousin worked with me to start with and then he was older and he retired out. And I just bought him out in state and uh, my back and things was in so much trouble that I could work when I had to, what I wanted to and I had to stay off I could without any problems you see. So I, I just managed to feed us, raise four kids. I was about to say, uh, uh, you, you married somewhere along the line. Oh had, yeah, I married a lady that had two children that okay. we had two. So uh, two kids, uh, two stepkids, and then uh, grandkids, great grandkids. I do now, I got a great greats. Great greats. <laughs> uh, do you know the number totals of grandkids? Uh, too many to count? Because some of them I wouldn't know if they come in honestly now. <laughs> uh, yeah, so many down the line. Uh, but you're you're, you're yeah. at the great great. Well, I had a grandson that uh, that uh, kindly uh, pulled away, you know, from me to his other grandfather and everything. And so, in his bunches, where I got the great greats, and he he might come by once a year. And I don't know their names or anything, the children. But he'll bring them every time one's born and introduce it to him. And I won't see them more for no telling how long. But you got a big family. Moved in this house in, in 1955. 55. So you've seen a lot of changes up this way, oh, Saudi yeah, Daisy. There wasn't nothing out there but a wagon train down through there, no pavement or anything. Dayton Bull or Dayton Park. Stopped right out here with his telephone. So. I'll be gone. <laughs> Four houses down there. Didn't have 27. Dayton Pike wasn't paved? No. Well, they have repaved Dayton Pike twice or three times since I've been here. Uh, but but it wasn't paved when you first got here? Or well, Dayton it? Pike was. Brand new, probably. The road, road that come off of Dayton Pike was just a just little road out here. It was just a path. Just like where you used wagons in it, you know, it wasn't. It had some gravels on it places ways. The gravel stopped out here at the telephone pole and there's one more house on down there anyway. So the last big thing I want to talk about is your recent celebrity status and going over there for the... Now was that your first time back? Uh, third time. Third, okay. But probably the most exciting I would say. The well, I went with the 50th anniversary with the with the 29th Divisional Association, went with the 50th, 
you couldn't do anything much because we had four buses, so. Mm -hmm. Kind of had to go with the group. Yeah, so we, we, one two buses would go over to do this this day and two over yonder, and then they'd swap the next day, you see. And so you didn't get to do much, and then as luck would have it, 1999, the lady in New York got in touch with myself and another uh, 29 out the 115th infantry down here in Red Bank. And of course, he come in the day after D Day, and I went there on D Day, and she was wanting some soldiers to go with them. They was setting up a plan to take school children. Or, well, 16 and up, and, and, and into the battlefields and things, and teach, do some teaching it's called Normandy Allies. You may have heard of it, still are going. Mm -hmm. And that was the first trip they went, and they wanted us to go with them for our what we knew. So you probably we, were able to teach them some things and go to some very specific locations that you remember. Yeah, you could, you could get in the spot where he is a hit or something like this and talk to the children and all this kind of stuff. And you remember stuff. the specific spot. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah and you went to those specific spots the, with the children. In the 50th anniversary, a guy by the name of Steve West in England got in touch with me and that other boy, I, mean, I got in touch with the other boy, and he told me that, that he would bring a, a jeep or two over there and show me around on one of the days we was over there. So naturally, I, I went for that. Well, come to find it out, when I got acquainted with him through the mail and everything, he owned a museum over there. 29th Division, was everything he done. He knew everything the 29th Division done, where it was. Maybe even was. more than you did. <laughs> so uh, I said, well, I'll be happy. So he picked us up. Uh, we had another soldier that went with us from up in North Carolina. So there's three of us. And they he come on Sunday when it's gonna take a whole day off. Well, it was actually the, the I said Sunday, it was actually the day that they're going to have the president over our talk, see. Uh, well, uh, Clinton was the president then. And he come over and got us and took us back out in the field. He, and I asked him how he knew. He said, you tell me what company you was with, what day, and I'll stand you in the field where you was. And he knew that much. I told him on May the 2nd, Company A, he stood me right here where our foxholes was. Now, not out where I got hit. You mean July the 2nd? But I was there where we was on our main line, where I was Company Runner. And I got to looking for the hedgerow that went down to go out to where I got hit. By the they, grenade. They cut the hedgerow down. There's a big field. But you recognized the landscape. I recognized the place where, where the company was set up. That's yeah. where you got hit by that German grenade? Yeah. Um, and, so yeah. how many presidents have you met? Did huh? you meet Clinton? Huh? How many presidents have you met? I didn't meet Clinton. He didn't. I was just back in the crowd. Mm -hmm. then. Uh, but, uh, but this time, uh, did, you, did you know the big ceremony going over there that that was going to happen? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because they was trying to get me. Well, what he done? He brought four jeeps in a carryall and some other uh, his torrents too. And we went out. They went out with us, and we talked out there almost almost too long, because we had to get back in to at a certain time, because they had locked everything down for miles around. Well, we got back, and they wouldn't let us in. So he went to about four different places. And they wouldn't let us in. No, you're not going. You're blocked out. And finally, I, I, I remember a little old thing that was about that wide and just striped up with, with stuff that they had given us, veterans, and I had stuck it in my pocket. So I was sitting behind him in the carry-all when they stopped us that time, and I said, show that guy this and see if that has any. He handed it to him. The guy wouldn't even take it. He said, go ahead. Now this is the 99, 1999 trip, right? 
And then with this last one, did you know no, that you... this was in the in the ninety four. Ninety four, ninety four. And uh, so that was a pass that I had and didn't know it. Anyway, but we got back there just a little while before he landed. So back to the cemetery where he gave his food. Now this this seventy fifth anniversary, you probably knew for a while that you would be going over there for that, right? The seventy fifth. Yeah. Um, did you know it was going to be the big uh, recognition ceremony that it was? You didn't know. No, have... no. Uh, they, see, I for some time myself had been trying to find another company, a man that landed on the first wave in, and they all gone. I couldn't find. Never been able to find one. Well, I was having people call me and ask me if I knew one and all this kind of stuff, and I didn't. Well, then this guy called and told me what he'd do. He said, yeah, I'll pick you up in your driveway and put you back in your driveway. Well, I was having some cancers taken out of my mouth and this, and the other, so I put it off and the third time. But then I, I told him I would go because the doctor got me healed up enough and left this until, until I got right here. When they were trying to find someone else from Company A, did you know that you're the only one, or that's kind of the the conclusion that was made, right, is that you're the only I, one. I didn't, I didn't connect the two, but uh, the uh, they led me to believe this that he uh, they were they was wanting some war veterans over there to sit behind him to make the speech like he has, you know, when somebody sat behind the him. The president, there, yeah. And that I'd just to be present back there, see. So that's, uh, I thought, well, that'd be a great deal anyway, you know, and, and, and they did. They put me in a wheelchair and carried me whatever I went. So that is, that is true, though, that you're the last of the Company A Omaha Beach survivors? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, that, that is what they said on that, so I, I don't know where they got that whole total information or anything, but I, I don't have any right to deny it or agree with it. You know? What is it, if you indeed are, what does that kind of mean to you to be the last person to carry on this, this legacy of Company A? Well, I don't know that it changes anything, really. It's just that I, I believe in the Lord, and I just believe it's blessings from Him that I'm in here now. Absolutely. Matter of fact, they interviewed me on television one time and asked me how I managed to get out of that on D-Day. I told them I had a praying mom and two praying aunts, and that's what got me out. And I, I still believe that same way, and I do know God's in charge of everything, and it's His business, and I'm willing to go as long as He wants me to go and go when He's through with it. Now, speaking of the president, did you know that he was going to personally recognize you in your speech? I didn't even know I was going to be recognized. When he called my name, I, I, I didn't know what to do. I, I felt like running, but I couldn't run. <laughs> yeah, you guys were kind of... In a wheelchair. <laughs> I think they had two rows of D-Day veterans there with you? Well, they had. Uh, we had the group that took us over to 14 veterans and male veterans and one nurse veteran that also worked over there. And they was all there, and they, they was uh, D-Day or close to D-Day anyway. All of them was, uh, well, some of them was different, different outfits too. You know, it wasn't all 29ers. In other words. Was that special to be personally recognized by the president? Uh, was that special to be personally recognized by the president? Yeah, uh, uh, it's hard to explain a feeling on it, but it's because one I never had before and not had it since. But uh, to to think that I've been kidding with some of them about being a Tennessee hillbilly, and here I am shaking hands with the president. So it's it's something you can't hardly imagine, you know. I don't know if you knew this, but you're his Twitter. You're his Twitter banner image, the president's. Did you know that? His what? Twitter banner image. No. Yeah, you're his, uh, you know. You know, they're always talking about on the news is tweets and stuff. Mm -hmm. you're, his, you're his image up there, up top. Here, let me, let me pause this and let me show you. Good. 
I'll show you here. It may still be up there. I'm pretty sure it is. You see yourself? Yeah. <laughs> and I think that gentleman who's sitting next to you is the other one who was who was yeah. recognized. Yeah. And I think the one over there, the black cow, was a uh, is a general. She's ninety nine years old. Isn't that cool? Yeah. I think that's him right there. 99 year old general is over the eighth, uh, eighth uh, tanker outfit. I talked a good deal with him, but, but it, it got kind of mesmerized me. I'll say it on the thing I know to say. And when they started putting me up front in the, in, in the van and Looked like treating me special and all this, and I asked them for just to make, keep, be sure that I got to sit in there with the rest of the guys that you look for breakfast and stuff, because I didn't want them to get offended at me to think I was a, something else. So, but they, I, like I told my wife, they was treating me as a king, and that didn't, I, I couldn't figure it all out. How long were you over in Europe total? Uh, How many days? This trip, 10 days. 10 days total, okay. So you went to a lot of these sites and ceremonies. They took me back to where I landed on the beach one evening, and I got a, they, got, they took some pictures of that. Now the first, Gun emplacement down there is covered up or gone. That was gone, but it was up on the hills there. It's very obvious. They, and it's up a steep hill. They loaded me in a wheelchair, and four of them pulled me halfway up to that other one, and it got so steep they was afraid they'd hurt me. They brought me back down. I never. Now, I can't even conceive of a group of people treating everybody the way they treated me, honestly. Did you get a lot of nice dinners? And Just as good to me as uh, all of us. All, all the, uh, everywhere the veteran went, if he needs a wheelchair, they'd load him up and take it. How many ceremonies would you say you went to? <laughs> How many days was over? Uh, that many, huh? Oh, Several. Well, big ones was that one and uh, then we had, oh, I, I don't know how many, but, but quite a few meals went with it, talking and singing and so on and so forth. And then the day they dropped the paratroopers, we was up there. They had lined us up, uh, uh, us guys together in the line sitting right up on the front of the, uh, in the building where we could watch them coming down, you see, and we was there. But while we was there, what little of them we got to see, we, uh, we was busy signing autographs and pictures. The company, well, I call them a company that took us over there, had brought a thousand pictures of each of us. And the vast majority of them was give away that day. And you autographed a lot of them. I asked, uh, I asked one of them over there, you any idea how many autographs that one of us would sign? And he said, well, the best I could figure it out, I'd say yourself a little over 600. <laughs> I said, you got to be kidding. How are you handling your uh, newfound fame? And. Well, I think they got about as curious about it as anybody could. And 
Did you know you were going to be basically become a celebrity, kind of? No, I had no idea. I might have backed out had I had no idea because, you know, that's not ever been me to seek glory for anything. I, but, uh, but now you are, <laughs> like, like it or not, I guess. Now I'm, I'm happy. Two quick uh, biographical questions before I forget. Did your brother make it out of the war? Okay. Yeah, he stayed in the Army 30 years. Wow. And uh, what year did you finally retire from television repair? Uh, 1989. 89, okay. So been enjoying retirement since? Yeah, uh, but I uh, stayed out about, uh, oh, maybe 60, 90 days, and I was too shaky. I got busy. I always worked. So you retired in 89, but you found some stuff to do afterwards. So, so I worked since I was 14. I didn't I can't get, I didn't get over it. But, uh, oh, you worked even to 014, you said? Yeah. From, wow. From, from, no, from age 14. Oh, age 14, sorry. <laughs> I worked all that time somewhere, everywhere I could. But, but, uh, but you found, even after uh, you officially retired, you found some work to do. I love another long story to make it short as I can. 1949, they sent an old doctor, woman doctor around here that was canceling all the, the uh, compensations that she could cancel. They, she called me in down there talking to me and, and uh, asking me sexually oriented questions and stuff. And, and uh, I, I well, just one question. She said, Mr. Pickett, when this happened to you, was you sleeping with anybody? No. I said, looked at her a minute, and I said, lady, I was a foxhole on the front line. Well, nobody up there but me. I was the only stupid one. If they had been, I would have been. So it goes on, and she asked me another similar question, and I said, mate, I believe I'm the one that's got the brains. I think there's something wrong with you. I said, I ain't staying. She said, I ain't through with you. I said, watch the door to see you. So I got up and left. She put in to cut my compensation from 50 to 30%. Now this I know by what I have done since, okay? So, the guy that was down there to talk about it to VA, I think it was Bookie Turner, who I believe it was, he took me out to another doctor. The other doctor made a little old record for his stenographer to write the letter off of. He let me hear it. He said instead of cutting the man, he should be raised to a minimum of 75%. Okay. Now, I trained to be a service officer since, so I know what happened then that I didn't know then. Okay, they got those two letters in there. They sent me a, a letter, come immediately prepared to stay 30 days in a hospital in Nashville. The captain had told me that they like to kill me and they're not to never take another, not let, absolutely refuse any kind of, anything that the doctor made because I couldn't stand that other treatment that way. Ain't no way you're gonna get me to go to the hospital, see? Cause that was the first thing that hit my mind. So I didn't go. They stopped my compensation totally in 1949. I got it back in 1988. 39 years they kept my compensation. That's what the VA used to be. And by far, it's not that. Now it's a beautiful operating thing now. But so it was almost kind of a a um, they they shortchanged you big time. Well, she really did for thirty nine years. See, I raised my family without that income. What I could beat out of the woods, you might say. Oh, so I, I get what you're saying. So when you retired is when you were finally able to start withdrawing on the VA again. Yeah. Well. Uh, uh, when I went and got the compensation back and found out that uh, kind of what had been going on, I knew I was not the only soldier that had been treated that way. So I was retiring 
And I decided I'd pay my way through school to train to be a service officer. I did that. In 89? And I, yeah, I, I, I actually got my, my diploma in 91. 91. And uh, I was a service officer out at the clinic there and for the clinic service officer for 13 and a half years. And I filed claims. So I know what the situation was back then. And they didn't, they wouldn't give me any back pay because it was a no-show, see. They just picked it up from there. But when they did pick it up, well, they sent it back at 30%. I filed a claim against it. And they raised it back to the 50%. And somebody from the main office over in the regional office in Nashville sent me another form to fill out and send it back. Well, at that time, I didn't exactly know what, but I filled it out and sent it back. And he raised me to 70% and started paying me 100%. 100? Yeah, for 100%. Did what it was was unemployable. And then... Uh, Soon after that, I had filed a claim on a back and leg condition, which I never was able to prove it. I was bothered with the flamethrower on that because that's where it started. And uh, so... I find it probably felt uh, really um, unjustifiable to see these percentages over time just be bouncing around almost arbitrarily based on the bureaucracy. Yeah, yeah, that's why I got so I get agitated at the VA, that way they operated then. And I wanted to try to help do something about it. Well, uh, when, <clears throat> see, I tried to file a claim on my back because carrying that flamethrower at 19 years old, running, hit the ground with it and all this kind of stuff, and my back's all crooked and tore it mm. from a skull to a sack it was bad now. I can't know nothing about it. Uh, got his office address, and I sent him the whole package to both places. So there's no, they can't claim that they don't have the record. And when they, when it got back, they was apologizing and everything. Probably for decades worth. And he sent me a copy of everything he sent them. And he told this man is a hundred percent total and permanent, disabled, combat-related, whatever he needs, you're supposed to do. The secretary said this? Yeah, the fee basis. Fee basis has turned it down. That bunch over at Murfreesboro are bad at it. So I've got a good lick at them too, you see. <laughs> and I filed claims over there. I know it's 13 and a half years since I filed claims with my... Uh, uh, certificates, right. but uh, 